So with that, I'm actually going to turn the program over to somebody who needs no introduction whatsoever, and that is uh, the former uh, head of the Department of Anthropology, former director of the Arizona State Museum, Rieger Professor Emeritus Raymond H. Thompson. And he's going to offer a few words about the history of field schools. If you would please help me welcome Professor Thompson. I actually have two roles to play, uh, and it's her fault. Uh, I became the unofficial alumni secretary for the archaeological field school students. Uh, I learned about this hundred year business one day in Diane's office, and uh, she commented to me they had a number of things going, and the field school was one of them. And they were very much hoping that they could get a list of all the people who had ever attended the field school. Uh, innocently enough, I said, well, I could take care of that. <laughs> I had already done that for the Point of Pines field school, and I thought that would be an easy thing. You'd think that at my age, I'd know better than to do that. I advise you all never agree to do something. Like uh, but anyway, as a result of that, uh, we came up with the fact that historically there have been 12 field schools and 1,382 students have attended those field schools. Uh, that's a lot of people, but it nevertheless is a very uh, exclusive group of people. They have come from uh, a large number of institutions, over 200 institutions have sent field schools to us. More than 14 foreign countries have sent field schools to us. The field schools outside of the University of Arizona in terms of numbers in this country have come from uh, about 215 places. But of that 215, 145 have come from Pennsylvania, Columbia, Harvard, Michigan, and Chicago. Uh, so we've had a very elite group of students come to our field schools. Now in more recent years, uh, the school will have uh, resources have become more diversified. Uh, and that's very good because we're reaching students in lots of other institutions. Well, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, we have the, I suppose, the advantage that that list of field school students has been published the wonderful young women who have edited this centennial edition of the Arizona Anthropologist have put all those names in here. Uh, I, I now urge you uh, to buy one of these, okay? Uh, they've done a wonderful job. You will enjoy a lot of what's in here, over and above the fact that some of you will be enlisted with lights on you. Uh, in that list of uh, field school people. Uh, <clears throat> it only costs 10 bucks, and Donnie Phelps, one of the editors, is gonna have a, a table over at the museum for the reception, and uh, I urge you uh, to uh, uh, go to that expense so that you will be able to have something to show your grandchildren that you did uh, when you are in college. <laughs> I noticed that there are a number of uh, uh, very I'm not going to say older field school attendees. Long-standing field school attendees with us here today. The first name on this list is Carol Abel Gifford, and she's hiding way up there in the back. And in front of her I see Jeff Dean, who went to the field school at Point of Pines in 1960. Uh, I'm afraid I'm the oldest one, because I attended Point of Pines in 1947. Uh, and I, I must say that while we're talking about the value of field schools, the value of field schools is that you meet wonderful people. And I met Molly Kendall <laughs> at that field school in 1947, and she became my wife the following year for 65 wonderful years. So there's a benefit of field schools <laughs> that we must, must not overlook. Well, I'm going to offer you some alternative history. We've come a long way in field training 
in the Southwest since the day on July 4, 1907, Hewitt took Alfred Kidder, Sylvanus Morley, and John Fletch Gould Fletcher, the head of McElmo Canyon in southeastern Utah, and said, and I'm quoting Kidder exactly, I want you boys to survey this country. I'll be back in three weeks. <laughs> well, since the days of uh, Hewitt's uh, teach him to swim by throwing him off the end of the pier system, we've come a long way. And much of that has involved the Arizona approach to field schools. Byron Cummings had a very different approach. And in 1909, starting in Utah and then here in Arizona, he began to pay students to the <coughs> uh, area around the Arizona and Utah border to explore the cliff dwellings and the wonderful scenery of that part of the world. And he developed a system of engaging students. Byron Cummings went with the students into the field. He cooked their meals. He prepared Dutch oven biscuits for them. This was a learning experience together. And that's been a very important part of the Arizona Field School experience that we need to cherish. Now, he changed, and now the field schools have been involving, right? And Cummings was part of that. He changed the system in 1930 when he moved to a single site, Kanishba. And there, people dug at that site year after year, and, and a lot of evidence was accumulated at one place. And Patrick Lyon's going to tell you about some of that in a moment. Uh, well, uh, when Howry came along, he wanted to have a field school also. Uh, and, and as Jeff Reed has pointed out, he put the field school in the Forestdale area so that he could begin to uh, uh, justify his Muggion concept. And, but he discovered that having a field camp at a small uh, site with a small number of students interfered with the engagement part of the field school. He was busy supplying them with food, he was busy keeping the camp going, and the idea of having research and teaching as partnerships was quite difficult. And so he decided that his next field school was going to be something different. And <coughs> so he went to Point of Pines, and he decided we're going to have a research project, the students are going to be involved. We're going to teach them. We're going to teach them to dig, to identify the objects, to recover them, to document them, to interpret them. We're going to teach them how to process it in the lab. And he was recognizing that world archaeology was changing. You no longer went to some exotic part of the world and came back with all the junk to stick in the cellar for 20 years while you got around to studying it. You studied in that country. And you came back with a bunch of notes, or you had nothing. He also felt that students needed to be kept clean, to have a nice place to sleep, and to eat well. And so he built some rustic cabins for students to live in, for the staff to live in. He built a large laboratory for lectures, for processing shirts, for learning how to do these things. He built a uh, kitchen and dining room center and produced an entirely different way of looking at the field school. He also introduced the idea that rather than the director of the field school publishing the result, the students are not going to do it. And out of it began to come papers by students, dissertations, theses, and so forth. Well, Point of Pines was also another interesting place because field schools do something else than just train students. They occupy a place. They bother the neighbors. Uh, you know, the, the, and, and Point of Pines was a locavore place. Uh, the food uh, came from the reservation. Point of Pines was located in the ranch on the reservation that supported the old folks uh, uh, programs of the uh, San Carlos Apache tribe. And so we bought our food on the hoof from the rancher. Every couple of weeks, he showed up with a butchered cow, a calf. 
And we hung that and used it for a while, and we ate very well. We did have a minor problem. Uh, some of the sites were far enough away so that people had to go and take a lunch with them. It was too much time wasted to come back to camp and eat lunch every day. And uh, the cook, Jim Williams, began to pick up word that some of the people were getting a little tired of roast beef sandwiches. <laughs> and so he decided to cure that problem. And the following day, he sent them out with their lunches. And when they opened up, the lunches were made of peanut butter and sliced onions. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it turned out that the roast beef was a very good thing to happen. <laughs> well, I uh, uh, had a very interesting locavore experience uh, at Old Coronado, which is in the Chiricahua Mountains, on on the edge of the San Pedro, of the Sulphur Spring Valley, and we uh, we supplied ourselves as much as possible from the neighborhood. And there was a wonderful woman in the Sulphur Spring Valley who had a, a chicken ranch. And she produced primarily eggs all by herself. This was an amazing operation. And so we had wonderful French egg, fresh eggs. The first time I went to her place, I was met by an enormous pig. <laughs> and he put his feet up on the windows and stared at me and just stared at me, and I just sat there. And she came out, spoke to him, he stepped down, she opened the door, and I stepped out, and he looked at me, came over and rubbed his side against my legs, and adopted me. He was her watchdog. Nobody came to that chicken ranch, but what, this, uh, this pig didn't take care of it. And every time I came after that, he came and greeted me like a, an old, just like a watchdog. <laughs> so there are all kinds of interesting things that can happen at field school. Well, then, of course, uh, uh, we went to Grasshopper. And I'm not going to say much about that, because Jeff is going to bore you with how uh, uh, all the students had to study behavioral archaeology. <laughs> but <clears throat> one of the things, a couple of things I want to mention about Grasshopper. One is the fact that Linda Bird Johnson spent a week with us. Now, I, I'm not bragging about Linda Bird or anything. She was a wonderful gal. The Secret Service guys were wonderful. We had a good two weeks. It was a, a, a very good experience for her and for us. What I want to mention to you is Linda Bird, the previous year, had gone to Greece. And everybody goes to Greece, falls in love with archaeology, right? And so she asked her father if she could have an archaeology experience in this country. And what did he do? He called up Harvard University and he said, what is the best place in the country to send my daughter for an archaeological experience? And what did they tell him? The University of Arizona. That's the important part of Lindeberg being at the field school. <clears throat> now, and now I want to tell you another little story about grasshopper. As you know, People eat, they produce garbage, people have to pump the water. There have to be some help at the field school. So staff, normally, were a couple of high school kids. And one summer, one of these high school kids was a man by the name of Charles Zukoski, who was now the chancellor of the University of Buffalo. And a couple of months ago, Chip, his name was Chip, was here visiting his mother. And he and I were having a chat. And he was telling me about arriving at Buffalo. And he was trying to introduce himself to the people there and also find out what was going on. So he had these little one-on-one -on -one meetings with the people that the chancellor had to deal with. And one of them uh, was the president of the faculty union. And apparently at Buffalo, before Chip got there, this relationship was a pretty testy one. Uh, and when I tell you that the president of the faculty union when Chip became chancellor, was Ezra Zubro. <laughs> you will understand that. <laughs> and so they got together, and Chip says that he asked Ezra to tell him a little bit about himself, where did he get his training. And, and so Ezra started telling him about his PhD at the University of Arizona and the wonderful field school experience he had at Grasshopper. And Chip piped up and says, I was a Grasshopper. <laughs> and bang. 
the nasty attitude between the faculty union and the chancellor disappeared. They've had a wonderful working relationship ever since. So think of what field schools can do for them. <laughs> well, field schools evolved. And one of the kinds of evolution was, uh, uh, in addition to digging, Grasshopper began to teach people to do surveys. Uh, in addition to that, NAGPRA had come, was coming along down the line. And before NAGPRA Act got there, Ch Jeff changed the system and no longer began to purposely look for burials. And, and, and so we, we see that no matter what we can brag about in our sense of involvement, that involvement and engagement for students is stinging all the time. Uh, it changed a great deal in ensuing years. Uh, the Arizona State Museum, many years ago, uh, I'm sorry to say many years ago, Sue, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, decided that, that we should pay more attention to the archaeology of our region. And we hired this wonderful couple, uh, Paul and Susan Fish. Uh, and they began to do a lot of work here in the Tucson Basin. And they enabled us to have field schools during the winter because we didn't want to expose students to the, the desert heat. So we got winter field schools, uh, where, uh, and, and that was another important evolution in the whole field school program. Now, I, I said in my little article here that has the 1,300 umpty-ump names on it, that I tried to be very inclusive. Unfortunately, I missed the field school, but Bill Dooley is here and he's going to tell you all about it. And the people who went to that field school now have the privilege of being the foundation of the next list for the next 100 years. And I'm sorry that they got left out. I want to leave you with one thought. Field schools, like all practical education, are pretty damn expensive. And which it's it's appropriate for us to ask, uh, what do we get out of it? Well, you know, the official business is that, that we teach people to dig and to identify artifacts and, you know, all of that stuff. And I think that's important. But the one thing that I think field schools do that no other place does as well, it proves to students that they should have an undying a loyalty to real archaeological evidence. The dignity of evidence that is in context and has associations is what makes archaeology work. And field schools do that more than anything else. What better way to have it happen than to find something and have a senior staff member come and show you how to expose it, tell you what the associations are and why they're important. That's what field schools do in the final analysis. Sure, they train people, but they train people to come away with a very important idea. Evidence of a real kind is what makes archaeology work. And it's now my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Patrick Lyons, who is going to show you why that evidence is important, as he tells us who, about the ways in which the evidence that was accumulated during Cummings Field School at Kanishba and Howry's Field School at Point of Pines is being used to promote some very interesting new interpretations in Southwestern archaeology. Patrick.